So good evening and welcome to our first inaugural of this academic year. Delighted so many of you could join us for what promises to be an enlightening talk. Great title. We're officially gathered here today to celebrate Aileen Douglas's elevation to a personal chair, the newly named chair of 18th century studies. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Gail McElroy. I'm Dean of the Faculty of Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences. Particular warm welcome to the Provost, Dr. Linda Doyle, who is with us here this evening, and uh, the head of the School of English, Professor Jarlett Killeen, and um, also to uh, several me family members, the Douglases or the Douglai, I don't know what it is in <laughs> plural, and I believe several of Aileen's school friends, but I'm sure she'll call you out in person. For those of you for whom this is your first inaugural lecture, Sure, they are significant events in an academic's life. They're significant events in the faculty's um, life also. Uh, it's an opportunity for a newly appointed full professor to showcase their research and their contribution to the academy. Um, they're joyous occasions uh, when we come together to celebrate our colleagues' excellence as a community. So it's uh, no hard, no, no uh, interruptions, no heckling. They're joyous occasions. Um, there's a ceremonial occasion also here in Trinity, which is why we are wearing our fancy gowns. Uh, Aileen's is in Princeton orange, which um, controversially is after William III of Nassau, uh, who might, <laughs> might be known as King Billy around here. The yellow on my sleeves is after a dandelion field, so uh, uh, it just goes to show, uh, you know, it, you know it, uh, it, it's not really that important. This is the third inaugural I have done for the School of English over the course of the past four years. Previous inaugurals, uh, Daryl Jones uh, in 2022 and Andy Murphy in 2019. And I think this, you know, the fact that there are three of them, that's very unusual. It's testament to the quality of scholarship and academic excellence in the School of English. Um, to have three full professors in such a short space of time is, is really, really quite an accomplishment. First Professor of English was appointed as recently as 1855, which is recent in Trinity's history, and was held by a very, very ambitious man, I won't go into it in too much detail, uh, but one John Kells Ingram, who got his professorship by lobbying the board. Hasten to add that Aileen got hers much more meritoriously, <laughs> no lobbying required. Though in fairness to uh, Professor Kells Ingram, he was a great lecturer and the founder of the moderatorship in English, which we still have today. So we have a lot to thank him for. And it was his direct successor, Edward Dowden, who really put the subject of English on the map, not only here in Trinity and in Ireland, but internationally. Um, he's one of the most important literary critics of the 19th century, and uh, you know, he's crucial to the development of the discipline. And English has never looked back since the appointment of Dowden in 1870. The various holders of English chairs in the past 150 years, including tonight's speaker, have played an important role in making the School of English what it is today, one of the world's most outstanding departments of English and Trinity's most highly ranked school. Currently ranked sixth in Europe and 22nd in the world in the QS subject rankings, it remains a very, very popular undergraduate uh, degree and the subject of many a campus novel. I'm still waiting for the political science campus novel, but I may be waiting a while. Now to tonight's speaker and the star of our show, Professor Aileen Douglas. Aileen holds a BA in English and History from TCD, an MA from the University of Delaware, and a PhD from Princeton. She returned to us in September 1993 after uh, a brief stint at uh, WashU in St. Louis, and she's been an active and integral part of the School of English and the university ever since. In her research, Aileen is internationally recognized as one of the foremost scholars of 18th century Irish writing and a pioneer in the field of 18th century studies more generally. She's indeed credited with opening a new field of study with her monograph, Work in Hand, Script, Print, and Writing, 1690 to 1840, which was published by OUP in 2017. This book explores the relationship between print and script at a time of technological change, uh, focusing on how handwriting was reproduced in printed form. Uh, printed script provided models for those learning to write, but it also contributed to the publication of autographs and author's signatures to the development of the celebrity author. As well as writing monographs, Aileen is a textual scholar whose editions of canonical and particularly neglected Irish women writers have completely transformed our understanding of early Irish fiction. 
She's the general editor of Early Irish Fiction Series with uh, Four Courts Press, for which she co-edited Sarah Butler's Irish Tales and Elizabeth Sheridan's The Triumph of Prudence Over Passion. Her forthcoming edition of Oliver Goldsmith's The Vicar of Wakefield, co-edited with Ian Campbell Ross, forthcoming next year with Cambridge University Press, will stand as the definitive edition of one of the most important and widely read works of 18th century fiction. But in addition to being a great scholar, um, Aileen is a very definition of a good citizen. She's had all the directorships in the School of English. She's additionally served as senior lecturer, which is a thankless task, I think most people would say. And she's also been head of school, which may be even a more thankless task. Over the length of her career, Aileen has been a research leader in the School of English, strengthening and enhancing the school's research culture in a variety of leadership roles. And she's been a key figure in the development of a dynamic and innovative research environment. She's been particularly assiduous in providing mentorship and guidance to early career researchers and postdocs and assistant professors. And I'd like to thank Jarlith for his input here. She's made the development of an inclusive research culture one of her main goals, and to quote Jarlith, as one of a small number of female senior members of staff in the school, Aileen has been an inspirational figure, especially given that we have 74% female students and 33% female professors. One of her former PhDs, Amy Prendergast, who is with us here this evening, also says of Aileen, uh, Aileen has always been a wonderful mentor. She's been a constant source of encouragement and support to me over the years, going above and beyond any official mentoring role. I'm always grateful for her extensive and constructive feedback, which is delivered with flair and marked by a generosity of spirit. She's an exceptional ambassador for 18th century studies and a brilliant role model for those of us lucky enough to benefit from her collegiality, mentorship, and supervision. It's hard to top that, Aileen, so well done. <laughs> The title of tonight's talk comes from a work by Sarah Trimmer, published in 1786, Fabulous Histories Designed for the Instruction of Children Respecting Their Treatment of Animals. Aileen will explore a range of 18th century texts that use innovative and imaginative forms to represent interspecies relationships, asking questions that are very current and topical, I think, such as what humans share with other animals and what sets us apart? How should humans treat non-human animals? And is it ever possible to really know a member of another species. With that, over to you, Aileen. Thanks very much, uh, Gail, Dean, um, Provost, Dean, colleagues from within the school and further afield. Um, I'm delighted to be here uh, this evening to give this inaugural lecture. Thank you all very much uh, for coming. Um, my parents, Eileen and James Douglas, can't be here uh, tonight, but they are going to listen to the recording later. So I'll just say a shout out. Hello, mom. Hello, dad. Uh, <laughs> reaching out um, into, into the ether. Um, and finally, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Valerie Smith and Barbara Suarez in the Office of the Faculty of Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences uh, for all their work in organizing the lecture uh, this evening. I re it really was a re revelation to me how much organizing um, uh, this kind of thing uh, takes. I'm going to begin Close to home and far away. Close to home with a work by Jonathan Swift, who graduated from this university in 1686, but far away because the work uh, I'm going to talk about is travels into several remote nature, nations of the world, commonly known as Gulliver's Travels. In an autobiographical fragment, the manuscript of which is one of the treasures of the Trinity College Library, Swift wrote that he hadn't really done all that well as an undergraduate here because he was sunk in his spirits, neglected his studies, and turned himself to reading history and poetry. And all his life, Swift loved reading history and travel accounts. Gulliver, Swift's most famous creation, is a ship surgeon and later captain uh, who suffers repeated misadventures at sea. 
After Gulliver's travels to Lilliput, Brobdignag, and Laputa on his fourth voyage, the ship's crew mutiny, and Gulliver eventually finds himself washed ashore where he eagerly expects to meet the inhabitants. There's a kind of synoptic cartoon reading of Gulliver's travels there in the three slides um, on the screen. At last I beheld several animals in a field and one or two of the same kind sitting um, in trees. Their shape was very singular and deformed, which a little decomposed me. Their heads and breasts were covered with a thick hair, some frizzled and others lank. They had beards like goats and a long ridge of hair down their backs. They climbed high trees as nimbly as a squirrel. They had strong extended claws before and behind. Upon the whole, I never beheld in all my travels so disagreeable an animal or one against which I naturally conceived so strong an antipathy. So Gulliver is still expecting to meet members of his own species, but he has traumatic recognitions ahead. Not only does he discover that these despised animals, yahoos, have a human shape, but the species governing the island, the whinams, or rational horses, identify Gulliver as one of these bestial creatures. Later in his sojourn, as Gulliver describes European life to the horse he comes to regard as his Wynnum master, he begins to view human conduct through the latter's perfectly rational eyes as a record of folly, corruption, and self-delusion. He becomes alienated from his own species and yearns to be a Wynnum. Expelled from Wynnum land, he takes a final leave of his host. And that's the central image there on the screen. But as I was going to prostrate myself to kiss his hoof, he did me the honor to raise it gently to my mouth. Detractors are pleased to think it improbable that so illustrious a person should descend to give so great a mark of distinction to a creature as inferior as I. Swift declared Gulliver's travels a treatise designed to prove that man was not a rational animal, merely one capable of reason. He also proclaimed, the chief end I propose to myself in all my labor is to vex the world rather than divert it. Since Aristotle, reason has been understood as the attribute that definitively separates human beings from other animals. So Swift questioned the extent of human reason and created a species of equine rationalists to puncture human pride and pretension. In creating the Yahoos, he drew on contemporary scientific work on hominoid apes, as well as accounts by voyagers of peoples um, beyond Europe. But why rational horses? It's been suggested that Swift was influenced by the prep propositions in a logic textbook by Narcissus March, specially designed for the undergraduates of Trinity College Dublin. Um, Swift didn't actually think very much of Narcissus March. Um, but the propositions, man is a rational animal, a horse is not a rational animal, uh, may have lingered with Swift, if only to reverse them. <coughs> Gulliver's humiliation in Winnemland places him in a world turned upside down, wherein hierarchies are reversed and human beings are neither primary nor exceptional. A world in which a horse raising a hoof gently to Gulliver's mouth for a kiss is an honor and a mark of distinction. From the beginning, readers delighted in much of Gulliver's travels, but the fourth book has always um, been accepted or often been accepted. There, readers have been, as Swift intended, deeply vexed to the extent that the voyage has been lambasted as a libel upon human nature and Swift himself as furious, raging, and obscene. From the time of the foundation of the Royal Society in England in the 1660s, shipmen and merchants such as Gulliver were encouraged in the interests of scientific endeavor 
to carry home from remote lands specimens of flora and fauna. The most e dramatic example of this gathering is uh, Captain James Cook's first voyage to the Antipodes in the 1760s, by which hundreds of plants and animal specimens were brought back to England. In his own small way, the fictional Gulliver participated in this process, albeit for entrepreneurial rather than scientific uh, reasons. So when he's in Lilliput, he decides he's going to take a couple of sheep home, um, which he does. Um, tiny, tiny sheep. The inhabitants are only six inches tall, so you can kind of work out the sheep are not so big. Um, he brings them back as curiosities, shows them for considerable profit, and eventually set, sells them for 600 pounds. He was quite keen to take home a number of the inhabitants in his coat pockets as well, but this the six-inch emperor sternly forbade. <laughs> Growth in trade, the increased circulation of objects and animate beings generated excitement, moral reflection, and literary innovation. Among the most interesting of 18th century subgenres is that of the it narration. These are fictions that are narrated by non-human uh, figures, coins, pens, coaches, atoms, which represent commercial society from the perspectives of powerless objects, and in some cases, animals, caught up in processes of buying and selling that are seen to increasingly dominate society. Allied to the structural mechanisms of the it narrative is Francis Coventry's The History of Pompey the Little. Here's Pompey now. Or The Life and Adventures of a Lapdog. The primary impulse in Coventry's text is satiric. The title, with its mock heroic conflation of things great and small, suggests a world askew and with an improper sense of proportion. Giving heroic treatment to a ball of fluff exposes the false values of fashionable society. In fact, Pompey's uh, history is a sad story of decline as he moves from human owner to human owner, losing value at each precarious stage. Um, at his lowest point, he's only worth a tankard of ale and a few oysters. Another low point is when he narrowly escapes vivisection by a fellow of Cambridge University, anxious to um, promote his scientific program. Notwithstanding Pompey's narrow escape in this regard, for 18th century writers, lapdogs of various kinds were often symbolic animals, deployed to make a point about fashionable excess. That lapdogs weren't always metaphorical can, however, be seen in portrait painting of the period where they're increasingly uh, represented alongside their human companions. As in this rather lovely painting by Joshua Reynolds. If I can just get the mouse to do what it should do. Yes. Um, Miss Nellie O'Brien. So, I mean, this is an absolutely stunning painting and the dog does look very comfortable. <laughs> Um, but I'm also struck by the fact that he seems to blend in rather well with the sitter's gorgeous attire, so he is a kind of fashionable accessory, if you like. I also think that he is more like a Bolognese lapdog than the image of Pompeii that we saw at the beginning, um, even, that's just um, by the by. Occasionally, Dogs earned their own solo portraits, as in this painting, <laughs> French painting, um, by Bachelier. Um, so this painting was included in an exhibition this summer uh, in, on dog portraits in the Wallace um, collection uh, in London. And when I saw the exhibition, I was very struck by the program note. So there were remarks on the... Uh, you know, the bows and the ribbons, all of these accoutrements um, as proof of how the dog was cosseted. And then at the very end of uh, the note, there's this tentative note, perhaps too much. Um, I, I might mention that Bachelier didn't just restrict himself to um, lap dogs and Angora cats. 
He did a lot of hunting paintings that were actually commissioned by Louis XV and that were hung in his um, hunting lodges. But returning to this question about whether this is too much, one commentator who would certainly have answered that question in the affirmative was Sarah Trimmer, author of Fabulous Histories, or the history of the robins, designed for the instruction of children respecting their treatment of animals, which was published in 1786. I'm using an image here from a much later edition, 1821, a popular edition, which is illustrated, but you can also see um, that this is um, a, uh, the 13th edition, so there have been a lot of editions um, of this um, over time. Trimmer is a fascinating figure because she held very conservative social views, but she promulgated them in very enterprising and progressive ways. She founded a Sunday school and a charity school along with two periodicals, and she published over 20 works, separate works of different kinds. Several of her works are written specifically for children, and she's an important figure in the development of children's literature, which is really sort of taking off as a field at this time. At the beginning of Fabulous Histories, she refers to an early publication of hers, an easy introduction to the knowledge of nature and reading the holy scriptures adapted to the capacities of children. So this work starts with two children. They just go for a walk with their mother around the house, and they discuss the flora and the fauna. And then gradually, uh, the narrative expands uh, to consider, um, uh, to consider other aspects of uh, natural history and foreign places. So these two children, we are told in the introduction to fabulous histories, contracted a great fondness for animals and often used to express a wish that their birds, cats, dogs, etc., could talk and they might hold conversations with them. Their mama, therefore, to amuse them, composed the following fabulous histories. So the histories, we are informed, are to be considered not as containing the real conversations of our birds, for that is something we would never understand, but as a series of fables designed to excite compassion and tenderness for those interesting and delightful creatures, but also to convey moral instruction to the young reader. With fabulous histories, Trimmer carries forward one of the most ancient and enduring literary forms, the fable. In its origins, as practiced by the Greek slave Aesop, the, the fable is a brief story or episode, often involving talking animals, but with a moral application for the human reader. Trimmer's fabulous histories alternates between a young family of robins, they're living um, in the orchard, and the, the human children who live in the house uh, to which the orchard belongs. The stories run in parallel, and while the children and the robins interact, uh, they don't actually hold conversations together. So the children talk to children and other humans, and the robins uh, talk uh, to robins. And this would continue to be a common strategy in works uh, featuring talking animals uh, well into the 19th century. For example, in Anna Sewell's um, animal autobiography, Black Beauty, uh, where horses talk to horses and humans talk to humans um, in this way. In some respects, Trimmer's stories are anthropomorphic. So the robins may live in a nest, but in other respects, their domestic arrangements are those of late 18th century bourgeois patriarchy. Um, I think the most anthropomorphic moment, perhaps, in the entire thing is there's a red start in the orchard, and he's shot, um, you know, shot. And it, with his, I, d I don't know whether red starts have dying breaths, but as he expires, <laughs> The red star says, oh, father, that I had listened to your advice. <laughs> um, you know, it's always very bad news not to listen to your father in 18th century fiction. Um, one might think of Robinson Crusoe. He didn't listen to his father, and he ended up in solitary confinement for a couple of decades. Fabulous Histories is not, however, simply a work that uses animal characters to enforce the social norms of humans. The treatment of animals is the work's central subject, 
and one explored multiple ways. The animal voices represented here are crucial because they encourage the child reader to feel with the birds and to empathize with their position. In their treatment of animals, Trimmer's child characters, and by extension her child readers, are warned against both wanton cruelty and immoderate fondness. The theft of birds' nests, the torture of cats and dogs, are carried out in the book by poorly brought up children and make for unpleasant readings. That these children themselves come to unfortunate ends adopts the view of very famously, um, I mean, it begins before John Locke, but it's very famously expressed um, in his Some Thoughts Concerning Education of 1693, that children who are cruel to animals will grow up uh, to mistreat the members of their own species. And the same kind of logic um, is visible in Hogarth's uh, series, The Four Stages of Cruelty, which begins uh, with the abuse of animals, a dog, and then ends um, in, 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 in uh, the maltreatment of humans. At the other extreme, excessive fondness and indulgence of domestic pets is castigated. So Harriet and her mother um, go to visit a Mrs. Addis, whose pets include a parrot, a paraquet, and a macaw in splendid cages, a lapdog again, who dominates one corner of the drawing room on an enormous cushion, a squirrel and a monkey, each in their own bespoke houses, and the monkey escapes uh, to cause havoc at the tea table. And meanwhile, the human children in the house are neglected and ragged. So the moral here is that the hostess has absolutely transferred the affection she ought to feel for her child to creatures who would really be much happier without. Narrating the daily lives of Harriet and Frederick, Trimmer takes the opportunity to introduce current but diverse understandings of the capacities of animals. The children are present at discussions of what was then a topical matter, the sagacious pig, who had recently intrigued fashionable London with its ability to count and communicate. So, um, and as you can see, this is an image by Rowlandson. Um, the, the, the poor pig is um, using cards. That's how the pig spells out the answers uh, to uh, these questions. It also composed music, but I'm not quite sure <laughs> exactly how that was done. So the children are also puzzled when a visitor to the house alludes to Cartesian notions of the animal as a machine. So for Descartes, non-human animals responded to stimuli, but were without consciousness, and the famous um, analogy that he uses in, in explaining this is that um, a clock tells the time. The clock is a machine that tells the time better than human beings tell the time, but the clock doesn't know it's telling the time. Trimmer's history also rehearses the ethics of pet keeping in a discussion of caged canary birds, and a visit to a farm provides the opportunity to consider animal husbandry and whether eating other creatures is wrong. The decision on the latter is that meat eating can be justified so long as the animals have been well treated while alive. And in fact, it's left to the humane farmer, Mr. Wilson, to articulate the importance of human advocacy on behalf of unspeaking beasts. As there are no courts of justice in which beasts can seek redress, I set up one for them in my own breast where humanity pleads their cause. Trimmer and authors who followed her in encouraging humane treatment to animals deploy what might be called the how would you like it trope to instruct children. How would you like it to be spun by your tail or locked in a cage or not, um, separated from your family? When one of the children wants to tame the robins and keep them in a cage, his mother asks if he would like to be always shut up in a room and denied the enjoyment of running about and going from place to place. Similarly, in Mariah Edgeworth's The Rabbit from 1801, young Rosamond is keen to keep a rabbit in a box and determined to make him the happiest little rabbit in the world. 
and her mother dryly rejoins, you had better consider how the rabbit would like it. In this story, to, in fact, the edge where it's had um, a, a sort of rather negative view on pet keeping in that they felt that and in their work, Practical Education, they expressed how, however enthusiastic children were about having pets, they were unlikely to make those pets as happy as they could be in, in um, outside captivity. In this story, Rosamond and her siblings discuss the, also discuss the ethics of meat eating, deciding to leave off eating meat today before changing their minds. And the discussion ends with them feeling they haven't got to the bottom of the business and with the eldest boy determining to think more on it and write an essay upon cruelty to animals. That's the kind of thing children say in Edgeward stories. They <laughs> like to write essays. Um, but, I mean, the point is that it's, it's presented in a serious way that this is a moral issue, um, that they don't, you know, they've talked about it and they've made some provisional findings, but they... They don't really know. They need to think about it uh, some more. Observation and discussion are two means of instruction used by Trimmer and Edgeworth. A third is directed empathy, so the how would you like it trope. And a fourth is the use of talking animals. Um, and here we're looking at um, a, an image, uh, an engraving of the, when the nestlings are um, disturbed um, by uh, the gardener. In Fabulous Histories, the speaking robins give the reader immediate access to the bird's point of view, providing an inkling of how, to other creatures, humans might appear terrifying and monstrous. Not only 18th century writing for children, but also 18th century poetry for mature readers brings a particular intensity to the representation of non-human beings. For one po poet at least, William Cooper, speaking on behalf of other creatures was central to his understanding of his poetic vocation. So Cooper suffered very badly uh, from depression and in his autobiographical writings he credited the keeping of tame hares as helping him to emerge from one particularly black episode. Um, he didn't actually, you know, he didn't take the animals from the wild. Uh, some children had them and they couldn't really uh, look after them, so he, he, took them, he took them over. In his long poem, The Task, Cooper is much preoccupied with the maltreatment of other creatures by human beings horse whipping, nest robbing and hunting, and the victims of those practices are all vividly treated. Of the hunt, he writes, detested sport that owes its pleasures to another's pain, that feeds upon the sobs and dying shrieks of harmless nature, dumb but yet endued with eloquence and agonies, inspire of silent tears and heart descending sighs. Elsewhere in the poem, he declares, I am recompensed and deem the toils of poetry not lost if verse of mine may stand between an animal and woe. Um, so this representation of uh, Cooper's hairs on the screen is from a, an engraving by William Blake, uh, reproduced in an early 19th century biography of Cooper by William Haley. And I was made aware of this image um, by its inclusion in a brilliant uh, recent book by Tobias Manley called The Animal Claim, Sensibility and the Creaturely Voice, um, a study that very much shaped uh, the account of Cooper that I've just given. So Blake, the engraver, uh, is an astounding presence in English literature, a poet and an artist, a craftsman and a mystic, whose work is animated by a profound belief in the interconnections of living things, for every living thing is holy. Blake is also unique in the way his works were created and disseminated. So he worked for commercial um, publishers producing images such as the one we've just seen. But, um, in his own works, uh, he didn't publish them, but produced from engraved plates 
that integrated uh, image and text. So you see there on the image the author and printer, William Blake. So he controls the entire process from the inception of the poem to its uh, dissemination. So far tonight, uh, we've encountered lapdogs, robins, hares, and horses, um, animals that have been familiar and often domesticated or tame. One of uh, Blake's animals, the tiger, is none of these things. Um, the dean uh, made a pleasant remark about my regalia um, earlier, which you might have noticed because it is indeed very striking. Um, and I, um, when I tell you that the university uh, from which I got my degree has a football team, and the football team is known as the Princeton Tigers, <laughs> you'll see, um, yes, well, you can figure the rest out for yourself. <laughs> I didn't uh, choose to talk about Blake just so I could, you know, talk about my, talk about my outfit. <clears throat> so the tiger. In his eight-volume History of the Earth and Animated Nature, published in 1774, Oliver Goldsmith described the tiger as the most beautiful but also the most noxious of quadrupeds. He notes of the one he's seen in the Tower of London, that although it appears good-natured and harmless, it is fierce and savage beyond measure. An insatiable predator, the tiger, is the only animal whose spirit seems untamable. I'm paraphrasing the account here. And no human actions have an influence on its heart of iron. Ralph Belby's General History of Quadrupeds, published in 1790, illustrated by Thomas Bowick, essentially repeats this characterization, describing the tiger as the most rapacious and destructive of all carnivorous animals, before going on to say, we are happy in being able to present our curious readers with an engraving of this rare animal, so this is the engraving that's on the screen at the moment, drawn from the life from a tiger that was exhibited at Newcastle in 1787 and was generally allowed to be one of the finest creatures of the kind ever seen in England. In an essay originally published in 1978, the novelist Angela Carter wondered if William Blake had ever seen a live tiger and she went on to opine that the beast illustrating Tiger Tiger quote, looks as if he should have a zipper down his back <laughs> and a pair of pajamas inside him. Other commentators, while admitting the tiger looks far too amiable to be the animal of the poem, draw attention to the marked similarity in stance between Blake's tiger and those of the kinds of works of natural history that I've just been talking about, including the history of quadrupeds. I want to stay with the history of quadrupeds uh, for a moment longer before returning to Blake. More precisely, I want to draw attention to a conversation about a general history of quadrupeds that occurs in Mariah Edgeworth's early lessons. I do so because the Edgeworth episode is concerned with issues of what and how we know about other animals that is also relevant to Blake's poem. So one of um, Edgeworth's child characters is given a copy, I mean, it's an incredibly expensive book, given a copy of the history of quadrupeds by his father. Um, this is something that we see quite a bit in Edgeworth's writing. Another book that a child gets or is, engages with um, is uh, Robert Hooke's Micrographia, published in 1665, which of course includes you know, the most astonishing images of what you can see under a microscope, um, images that are kind of credited with really animating um, an extraordinary line in 18th century poetry and in 18th century uh, writing generally, the ability to see beyond what uh, we can uh, see um, unaided. But anyway, Frank is only six, <laughs> so a good deal of the text of the history of quadrupeds is too advanced for him, but he enjoys looking at the pictures. His enjoyment of the book prompts his curiosity and a range of epistemological queries, which he 
uh, raises in conversation with his mother. So he asks how the person who wrote about animals in my book that my father gave me find out all that he knew. And the mother replies, partly from reading other books and partly from observing animals himself. But Mama, said Frank, how did the people who wrote the other books know all the things that were told in them? No slouch, Frank. By observing, said his mother, different people in different places observed different animals and wrote the histories of those animals. I'm very glad they did. Did they ever make mistakes, Mama? <laughs> yes, I believe they did make a great many mistakes. Then not everything in books is true, is it? No. Edgeworth, being an Enlightenment thinker and in general an optimist, ultimately ends this conversation in ways reassuring to Frank's pursuit of knowledge. But Blake's uh, case is different, and I'm going to read The Tiger. I am, it's, it's on the screen, but I'm not sure you can read it. Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night, what immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? In what distant deeps or skies burnt the fire of thine eyes? On what wings dare he aspire? What the hand dare seize the fire? And what shoulder and what art could twist the sinews of thy heart? And when thy heart began to beat, what dread hand and what dread feet? What the hammer, what the chain, in what furnace was thy brain? What the anvil, what dread grasp, dare its deadly terrors clasp? When the stars threw down their spears and watered heaven with their tears, did he smile his work to see? Did he who made the lamb make thee? Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night, what immortal hand or eye dare frame? by fearful symmetry. Did he who made the lamb make thee? In the lamb, a poem from Blake's Songs of Innocence, the child speaker catechizes the little lamb, asking, dost thou know who made thee? Before happily answering that the lamb's creator too is called by thy name. In the state of innocence, enfolded within a mythic order derived from Christian belief, there is an assured unity between animal, human, child, and divine creator. In contrast, the speaker of the tiger cannot tell what creative force brought this terrifying being in, beast into being. The god of Genesis looks upon his works and sees that they were good, but can the forger of the tiger smile his work to see? Does the power of the creation exceed that of its maker? Is it possible to consider the tiger and believe in a creative power that is all powerful and all good? To be an advocate, to speak on behalf of another being, presupposes a foundation of knowledge or sympathetic identification. Certain of William Blake's poems advocate on behalf of non-human creatures, auguries of innocence, for example, which confidently insists that a robin redbreast in a cage puts all heaven in a rage. In the tiger, though, there is absolute separation between speaker, animal, and unknown creator, and what shoulder and what art could twist the sinews of thy heart. These lines remind us that in contemporary natural history, the tiger was seen not, uh, not only noxious and predatory, but also, in Oliver Goldsmith's phrase, iron-hearted, resolutely apart, evading the languages of men. The tigers of wrath are wiser than the horses of instruction, Blake wrote in The Marriage of Heaven and Hell. The horse, in contrast to the untamable tiger, was an animal of great utility, amenable to human control and integrated into human society, so chief among quadrupeds in its usefulness. This aphorism is usually interpreted as meaning that the passions are wiser than reason. Angela Carter, in the essay from which I quoted earlier, is thinking about Blake's poem and this aphorism in the context of a human disposition 
not to see or represent actual animals, but to project onto them what she calls our own beastliness or fantasies of innocence. Of course, we began this evening with horses of instruction, though not of a Blakean kind, the Whinhams, a name, we are told, that means perfection of nature. It's the name the Whinhams uh, give themselves. The version of the 18th century I've presented here is one of enlightenment and progress, of the possibility of knowing more in a literal sense and knowing better in a moral sense. But unlike the Whinhams, or at least unlike the way the Whinhams prefer to think of themselves, unlike the way we sometimes like to think of ourselves, enlightenment is never complete, never perfect. Instruction takes many forms. It's there in swift satiric insistence that human beings have misunderstood their distinctiveness. It's there in Sarah Trimmer's imaginative work for children concerning their treatment of animals. It's there in Edward's child pursuing an expensive book of natural history and there too in Cooper's aspiration that his verse might stand between an animal and woe. One of Blake's most famous aphorisms is that without contraries is no progression. In the literary works I've talked about tonight, animals are realized between sameness and difference, between sympathy and symbol, between patient attention and fabulous history. Thank you. <laughs>